Right. Good afternoon, everyone, again. And welcome to our Kawasa Wednesday webinar for water operators in the Caribbean. And as we try to bring to you, um, you know, recent developments and other activities, this afternoon we will have with us um, a representative of Sherwin Williams um, Company, and this is, who is Mr. Brian Hoffman, and he is the business development manager for water. I will allow. Uh, we also joined with one of his representatives in the Caribbean who met with us in St. Lucia and had some discussions, and that's how we were able to initiate this um, their participation and guest presentation. So I'd like to thank David Melius for joining us as well. And he is one of the Sherwin Williams representatives in the Eastern Caribbean. Welcome on board. And let me welcome all of our other operators from across the region this afternoon. I know some people are running a bit late, so they're going to join us as they pop in. Remember, you can post your questions or comments in the chat room. And at the end of the presentation, we can always take them. So over to you, Brian. You can, you can please start. Outstanding. And I, I do appreciate the opportunity to speak with you guys today. Uh, as, uh, as the introduction said, I'm with Sherwin Williams. My name is Brian Huffman. And I have, uh, as announced, my job title with Sherwin Williams is Business Development Manager for the Water Infrastructure Market. Uh, I've been with Sherwin Williams, really in the coatings industry, and with Sherwin Williams for about 28 years. Uh, so, really, as 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 an adult, this is really the only type of stuff I have ever done in my life is uh, is coatings. And about the last 15 years has been dedicated to coatings just for the water and wastewater infrastructure markets. Uh, I've worked with them extensively uh, throughout the United States, and then two or three years ago. Uh, I had the opportunity to become a support structure for uh, for David and the rest of the guys down in the Caribbean where I get to work with them. And, uh, you know, I appreciate that opportunity. And, uh, again, I appreciate you folks giving us the opportunity today to speak with you uh, about concrete rehabilitation. So the focus of today's presentation, I'm, gonna, I'm going to speak heavily or really a lot of focus towards uh, the sewer collections industry. And that could be uh, concrete manholes, that could be concrete lift stations, wet wells, but also the, the same discussions that we're gonna have in the sewer collections industry is very relevant to the wastewater treatment as well too. Uh, wastewater treatment generally has a tremendous amount of concrete structures uh, and that concrete is a Basically, it's a material that can degrade in some of the harsh environments that we put these concrete structures in. Uh, also, in the water treatment facilities, there's a good bit of concrete as well, too. And while we take some different approaches as far as how that concrete corrodes or, or really more so erodes, uh, this conversation and, and the presentation I've got put together really, again, is focused a lot on sewer collections, but it's relevant to the wastewater treatment and also the water treatment as far as, uh, as, far as the concrete structures. Um, so I hope there's benefit to this. Uh, I hope this is, uh, this is some good information for you folks. And uh, again, as, as, as Mr. Gene announced, if you'll post your questions over in the chat room as we go, uh, then we'll try to do a question and answer seminar at the end of this as well too, uh, to make this as beneficial as possible for you folks. Again, I appreciate everybody attending this today. So what we're gonna talk about today, again, the title says manhole rehabilitation, but let's not focus this just on manhole uh, and sewer collections rehabilitation. Let's talk about this from the forms of clarifiers uh, at the wastewater treatment plant. Let's think of this as the headworks uh, where the, the, the sewage comes into the wastewater treatment plant or really any concrete structure in the sewage collection or wastewater treatment uh, segment. So we're, today's agenda and what we're going to talk about is why rehabilitation matters. 
why does it matter that we take care of our infrastructure? Why does it matter that we maintain our infrastructure and don't let our concrete get eroded? We'll talk some specifics about manhole problems. We'll talk about microbial induced corrosion, which is the leading cause and really the big reason as to why we have concrete degradation in the sewer collections and wastewater treatment industry. We'll talk about inspection techniques. We'll talk about repair materials, repair techniques. We'll talk some about lining systems. Uh, we'll talk about testing. And then to summarize, we'll talk about RFP qualifications, stuff that you need to give thought to requiring of a contractor before you let them do work in your facilities or on your infrastructure. We'll talk about that. The closing piece of this is we'll have a case history and I'll show you some before and after photos of some sewer collections uh, structures that we have done some linings in. We've rehabilitated uh, after they've lost about three inches of the original nine inches of concrete, about a third of the structure had pretty much been eaten away. Uh, and then we came in and did rehabilitation and I'll show you the before and after of such. And then the final thing I would like to show, if I have good enough Wi-Fi signal to, for it to display properly, I've got a demonstration uh, basically showing the concrete rehabilitation products, a video uh, illustration or demonstration, showing some of these products, how they work and how really pretty simple they are to use. Uh, so we'll show that at the very end as well. Again, assuming my Wi-Fi signal is strong enough to, uh, uh, to get that to display. So let's talk about rehabilitation and why rehabilitation matters. Every day throughout the world, millions of people pass over manholes, be it on foot, be it on vehicles, without ever noticing them. Manholes up until about 20 years ago were really thought to be out of sight, out of mind. You didn't see it. You didn't realize there was degradation going on. You looked at it a few times a year and you, you, you didn't really pay that close of attention to the changes. Same way with lift stations. You know, the lift stations in these, in these sewer collections uh, structures, the lift stations, it's a really aggressive environment where we're losing a lot of our concrete structure. And if you think about it again, if something's built with nine inches, say 12 inches of concrete, and three or four inches of that gets eaten away due to corrosion, you know, we're losing a lot of our structural integrity in our infrastructure. That out of sight, out of mind mentality is really a scary thing. And these manholes are an important part of the infrastructure. Their failure could lead to big, big problems throughout the collection system. Uh, I'm assuming that, uh, that you folks down in the Caribbean, just like us up here in the States, you know, when these manholes and sewer collection structures fail, collapse, give way, uh, that's catastrophic problems. I mean, that's catastrophic problems. And through proper maintenance and really realizing what's going on in the collection system, uh, we can eliminate a lot of these failures from ever occurring. During rainy weather, an average manhole that's leaking contributes from 3,000 to 12,000 gallons of rainwater per day. That's one average manhole. It contributes that much rainwater into the system on a heavy rain event. That causes the corrosion, that causes increased cost as far as having to treat that wastewater because once rainwater gets into our collection systems, that rainwater has to be treated just like it was sewage coming down through somebody's house or a commercial structure or whatever the case may be. So we're gonna talk about ways to keep rainwater out of our collection system from the start, okay? The start, to start with, we'll talk about leaking manhole rings and covers. A damaged seal between the manhole cover and frame will be a tremendous source of inflow coming into our structure. It will be the inflow covers, or I'm sorry, covers, manhole covers over time, they become loose fitting. Uh, they're made of steel, they're made of metal, and metal corrodes. Metal, uh, as it corrodes, it gets smaller because corrosion is basically the metal being eaten away. So where you may have a tight fit on a new manhole cover, 10, 15, 20 years later, you're gonna have a very loose fit, which is gonna allow a good bit of rainwater to get into that system. Uh, the deterioration itself, you know, it could be from, uh, if it's a, in a roadway, where you have a manhole in a roadway, and it's constantly getting ran over by truck, trucks and cars and, you know, really beaten up a little bit. 
you know, that's going to cause those things to come loose. So an encouragement I'll give to you guys is as part of your sewer collection system, make sure that you're addressing and looking at making sure those manhole covers fit and seat properly. And if not, give consideration to doing replacements on those things. That keeps a tremendous amount of the inflow water out of our systems. Again, inflow is storm water that enters into the sanitary sewer system at points of direct connection to the system. You know, I'm assuming down there in the Caribbean, you guys have never seen uh, rainwater events where you had water gushing up out of the manholes. And I hope that's, uh, I hope you don't have those situations down there, but unfortunately I would be venturing a guess that you probably do, just like what we do up here in the States. Uh, as we get into these big rainwater events, we basically get too much water in our systems that the system can handle, and it's got to come out somewhere. Unfortunately, again, these overflows like what you see in these two photos, that's real, and that's real stuff that happens, and that can be fixed. We can help manage that stuff for you. Let's talk about infiltration. Infiltration, the inflow is rainwater coming in from the surface. Infiltration is groundwater that enters the sanitary sewer systems through cracks or leaks in the sewer pipes uh, or in the manholes. You know, whenever we have cracks, whenever we have aging structures, whenever we have deteriorated structures or poor design structures uh, or root intrusion where a tree roots growing into our system, you know, we, once we start getting those voids, the chances of water infiltration go up exponentially. Anytime we have any kind of a hole where we have a high water table, uh, again, there, there's issues with groundwater getting into our system. And this is something that we have to look at. Uh, there are fixes for these applications. There's fixes when we have these issues. I've went, I've went in and sprayed and rehabilitated a manhole. I'll never forget this one in particular. There was about a one inch stream of water. It was about a five foot deep or five foot wide manhole. Uh, I went into the hole and water was in, in about a one inch stream coming out of one wall, splashing off the other wall that had that much head pressure to it. And, you know, these are things that can be fixed at a relatively cheap cost, but it's stuff we need to be aware of and consider doing repairs in these structures. That way we can minimize how much groundwater we're having to treat as sewage and minimize our wastewater treatment costs. In brick manholes, any spot where the mortar has deteriorated or individual bricks have given away is a prime spot for infiltration. Because if you think about it, a brick itself in a brick manhole, if it's missing or if the concrete is gone, that means we've lost about four inches of structural integrity. And if four inches of something is missing, again, out of an original eight inch, nine inch structure, we're gonna have spots where water is gonna be getting into our system. On concrete manholes, where they're basically stacked, the precast concrete manholes, the joints connecting the segments of the cone and the barrel are very susceptible to infiltration. Whenever these things are built, there's a rubber gasket that's put in in between where they're stacked on top of. But unfortunately, during part of the construction process, these, these gaskets that are put in are often torn, become bent, or there may be some settling that causes a point of infiltration as the structure itself shifts and as it settles. I mentioned traffic loads earlier. Manholes on busy, busy city streets, particularly those that are transversed by heavy trucks or heavy commercial vehicles, are particularly prone to defects stemming from traffic bearing loads. If you think about it, a 40,000 pound truck having an impact on a manhole constantly all day is going to do significant damage to that manhole. It must be maintained to keep from keep the structural integrity of it. The primary areas that it affects are the frame and cover section and the chimney itself, the top of the cone of the manhole. This can affect how the cover sets on the frame and also it can create avenues from, for inflow from stormwater runoff. Again, if everything doesn't set up or set really nicely uh, and tight, then we have the potential for rainwater inflow to get down into our storms, into our uh, sanitary sewer systems. So let's talk about microbial induced corrosion. And this is, this is getting a little bit more into the meat and potatoes as far as the erosion or the degradation or the basically disappearing of the concrete structures that we have in our infrastructure system. 
again, this is not specific to the United States. This is not specific to the Caribbean. Anywhere that we have wastewater in a concrete structure, microbial induced corrosion is a serious, serious problem. Microbial induced corrosion is the reason why our concrete's getting eaten away. So let's talk just for a bit about what microbial induced corrosion is. That way we kind of understand exactly what we have going on in our concrete structures. That way we know how to protect the concrete from this occurring. So we have basically two corrosive gases that are in our sewage collection system and also in our wastewater treatment system. First one is hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide gas is extremely corrosive to metal and to concrete. And it, it attacks concrete by basically reducing the pH level. Happy concrete, concrete that's not being destroyed, if you will, happy good concrete has a pH of over nine, nine, 10 uh, in that range. These, this hydrogen sulfide gas works to reduce that pH level and it also gets converted to a sulfuric acid as part of the system. We'll talk about that a little bit more here in just a second. We also have the, uh, the presence of carbon dioxide, CO2, in our collection system and in our wastewater treatment system. CO2 gas slowly deteriorates the concrete. It's not quite as aggressive as what we have with the hydrogen sulfide gas. It's something naturally occurring and it also, it also acts to reduce the pH of the concrete but not quite as aggressive as what hydrogen sulfide does. And a result of this is carbonated concrete, which is a soft, powdery, kind of a mushy concrete, if you will. So the four phases of microbial induced corrosion, phase number one, we have sulfur reducing bacteria. It breaks down the sulfates in the waste stream. And this is where the hydrogen sulfide gas and the CO2 gas are generated. They produce it. These sulfur reducing bacteria, again, that's, that's the source of the hydrogen sulfide gas that we deal with in our systems. Going to phase two, these two gases, hydrogen sulfide gas and CO2, act to reduce the pH of the concrete from a good 12, 11, 12, to as low as nine. Hydrogen sulfide gas alone will only reduce the concrete pH down to about a pH of nine. Sulfur oxidizing bacteria attach to the surface as these sulfates are produced. They start attaching to the surface and almost colonizing, if you will. So let's go to phase three. The sulfur oxidizing bacteria are known as thiobacillus thixidens. They consume hydrogen sulfide gas. They're eating what is naturally occurring in our system. They're eating this hydrogen sulfide gas, but the problem they cause is they discharge a sulfuric acid. They excrete sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid, as we know on the pH scale, as it lays on that concrete, aggressively drops that pH. It's very aggressive and it brings that pH down. I've been in concrete structures and seen a pH of four before on a wet well where we had a strong hydrogen sulfide gas presence. This pH continues to drop, microbial growth accelerates, and it creates more sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid is the true enemy in the wastewater treatment and also the sewer collections industry. That's what's destroying our concrete. In phase four, the final phase of this, the acid attack of the concrete creates a layer of gypsum. As organisms reproduce, additional acid is produced, and then we have eventual structural failure. Once this process starts, which is a naturally occurring process, it gets more aggressive and more aggressive and more aggressive. And it's just, that's, that's where we end up with catastrophic failures and how we end up with those catastrophic failures. I took a couple photos here and these are a few years old, but if you look at the structure on the left is a gate going into a wastewater treatment plant. And if you'll notice in that photo, you can see, and I don't know if you folks can see my cursor or not, but if you can see this carbon steel gate here and the level of concrete degradation, I'm sorry, the steel degradation, the rust, the corrosion, the pitting uh, that has occurred on this structure, this gate here is only about a, I think it was an eight or a 10 year old structure. That was not a very old structure. 
In that photo on the left, you'll also notice down towards the bottom, because hydrogen sulfide gas is heavier than air, it lays on the bottom. You'll notice there on the bottom, the concrete deterioration is much more aggressive on the bottom than it is as you come up the structure itself. If I remember correctly, I think we had lost about an inch to inch and a half of concrete there along the very bottom. A similar photo on the right is primarily a concrete structure. This one doesn't have the steel where I can show you, that, uh, show you that level of degradation. But if you'll notice on the concrete structure in the photo on the right, you see those little lines that are coming down. If, again, if you can see my cursor, you see those lines coming down. You see them on this one as well too. That is where we have lost about two and a half inches of concrete and that is exposed rebar that is starting to show and be deteriorated as well too. So at this point, we're beyond the cover of the concrete and we're starting to have structural integrity issues that have to be addressed. And this, these structures, as they were built new, uh, were just left alone, uncoated, unlined concrete. And this, this, this goes to show some of the levels of degradation that we have in our systems that can be fixed, but also as points of new construction, when we build these new things, we've discovered that putting a chemical resistant or acid resistant liner inside these is a really low cost option to extend their life cycle from about a 10 year level of degradation that we see in these two photos to where we can have a 30 or 40 year life cycle uh, with a protective coating back over the top of it. These two photos, the photo on the left shows a brick manhole. And again, I'm not sure if down in the Caribbean, if you guys have a lot of brick manhole structures, but if you do, the photo on the left is very representative to some 30 and 40 year old brick manhole structures. If you'll notice in that photo on the left, you see no concrete holding those bricks. The concrete has been eaten away over the years as a result of the sulfuric acid and the hydrogen sulfide gas attack. So basically we have a stack of just literally stacked bricks holding up and maintaining the integrity of this structure. Again, these are structures that can be repaired, that really need to be repaired, uh, and we'll show you an approach to that here very shortly. The photo on the right shows a precast manhole. Uh, the precast manhole, as you can see, the bench and invert section down the in the very bottom of it has been very aggressively attacked. Best I remember, there was about an inch and a half of concrete missing from the bottom of this particular manhole as well too. So let's talk about the inspection piece of it. Some of the common issues that we see in manholes, wet wells, lift stations, and going into the plants in the headworks and on the front side, the influence side of the plant itself, we see a lot of common issues like cracks and breaks. We see infiltration and inflow. We see issues where we have joint security where things just aren't lining up, misalignments, grease accumulation, root intrusion, debris, and then what I focus on in my, my work, as well as David, uh, we focus on corrosion. Those are the common issues that we see. So let's talk about a couple of methods as far as looking at our structures, the ones that are out of sight, out of mind, the ones that are below ground, the stuff that we don't see every day. The most common method is a visual above ground survey. It's fast, it's not expensive, and it's a safe way of determining what you have visually going on just by opening the cover, looking down in it, and then recording information as such. A visual inspection, again, is the most common because it's the safest. It doesn't require any sort of entry. A manned entry is my preference as far as evaluating true deterioration in manholes, wet wells, and again, some confined space structures within the wastewater treatment industry. Manned entry is one of the most popular methods for getting a detailed inspection of a structure. It involves setting up a tripod on the street above the hole and lowering an operator with one fall, uh, fall protection and two retrieval in case something goes bad. Uh, it's, we get that set up and is required to do this type of entry. 
we want to either have a breathing apparatus or air monitoring tools just to make sure that everything is safe before we do the manned entries. The advantages of doing a manned entry as opposed to just opening the top and looking down into it, it allows for a close-up examination of the surface of the structure itself. It allows you to sample materials. It allows you to take a small chipping hammer, screwdriver, something like that, to see the integrity of the remaining concrete or the brick. And it really lets you find out exactly what you've got going on within that structure, the manned entry method. Pole cameras are becoming more and more popular for these type of inspections. Uh, they, the advantage is twofold. It eliminates the hazards of going into a manhole, but it also gives you a recordable video condition up close of what you have going on down inside the structure itself. Here's a picture of a pole camera inspection. And as you notice, you see the camera at the bottom going, getting ready to break the, the ring of the hole and you see the wires coming up it. This has led to a computer, usually parked in a van or a truck nearby, where they can actually record and video and see up close what's going on by doing this type of inspection. It gives you a whole lot better view than just looking down in the top of it. There's also crawler cameras. These are fairly expensive. Uh, they're, they're becoming more and more common, but this, uh, this scanning technology works by using two high resolution fisheye cameras facing opposite directions on a wheeled crawler. As the camera goes through the pipe, down the hole, digital snapshots are taken. And this actually allows you to go up through the sewer collections pipe itself in between the mad holes, going a little bit beyond uh, what we can do just looking in the mad holes and wet wells themselves. Everything's instantaneous. There's a fiber optic cable coming back to, again, the van or the pickup uh, where the, the monitors are set up at. Here's just a, a cool little picture of one of those. We talked about infiltration. Infiltration is cracks that, again, could be in a wet well, manhole, whatever the structure may be. Uh, cracks will allow groundwater to get into our systems. And of course, again, as groundwater gets into our systems, it must be treated as, of course, uh, wastewater as it's being collected. There's a couple of approaches that we can do as part of manhole rehabilitation, wet well and lift station rehabilitation. We can stop active leaks. I mentioned earlier the, the manhole that I went into that had a, about a one inch wide stream of water splashing off the opposite wall. Uh, we were able to stop that leak with using hydroactive grouts. And these are some injection resins that are, you know, I wanna make mention of this technology, but we're not gonna go too deep into it today. Uh, and if you want more information on this type of technology, you can reach out to me or David. I'll give you our contact information at the very end of this presentation. Uh, but these hydroactive grouse work really, really well, really simplistic to use, and really low cost as far as stopping groundwater intrusion from getting into our structures. So let's talk about rehabilitation materials. I showed you pictures of some really bad structures. Uh, and some structures that had really had a lot of degradation. Let's talk about the materials that we can use to rehabilitate these things. Portland cement is the most common use cement whenever we do the new precast or the cast in place of any wastewater component. Again, if it's a headworks in your facility, if it's a new manhole, a new lift station, uh, a new flume, whatever it may be made out of concrete in your facility, I would about guarantee you it's made out of Portland cement. Number one reason for such is it's relatively inexpensive. The number two reason is very readily available. It's cheap and it's pretty much everywhere where you can get your hands on it quickly. So this is our main construction standard, Portland cement. The downside of Portland cement is it's extremely, uh, it's extremely susceptible to microbial induced corrosion. We talked about the different bacterias. We talked about the hydrogen sulfide gas. We talked about the sulfuric acid. It's very susceptible to all of this stuff that occurs naturally within our sewer collection systems and our wastewater treatment systems. So what we use and what us, my company, uh, what the majority of rehabilitation companies recommend as far as for using rehabilitation, uh, is a microsilicate mortar. 
microsilicate repair mortars utilize Portland cement to create the cement paste, but they also have some, uh, they also contain a fume silica admixture that makes a much, much greater density of the substrate itself. It's a much lower permeability. It's a much more resistant, uh, chemical resistant, lower permeability substrate once we rehabilitate these things uh, using microsilicate mortars. In a very, very mild H2S environment, uh, it can be used as a standalone liner. But what we generally use it for is for putting air protective epoxy coatings back on top of it. It's very fast. Uh, with standard Portland cement, you cannot put coatings and linings back on them for 28 days minimum. Uh, with the microsilicate repair mortars, we can concrete it one day and then coat back over it with the protective lining the next day. So it's a very, very fast cure time for top coating. Then we have calcium alumate mortars. They maintain a higher pH than microsilicate mortars do. So what we generally do in the more aggressive structures, in the structures that have a lot of degradation or a real low pH going on, we'll look at doing recommendations of a microsilicate mortar and then an epoxy coating back over the top of it. If it's a very mild, uh, very, very non-aggressive uh, area of the collection system or the plant, we may do a calcium alumate mortar as a standalone without having to put epoxy back over the top of it. Again, it maintains a very high pH that prevents the colonization of the thiobacillus bacteria, which again, if you remember, is what causes, is what excretes and causes that sulfuric acid accumulation. It offers an improved life cycle, much longer than standard Portland cement, it's very fast curing. It's susceptible to microbial induced corrosion, but it's a greatly reduced rate as opposed to what Portland cement is. Let's talk about the chemical resistant linings. So the goal of our chemical resistant linings is to take the bad environment in the sewer collections, the lift stations, the more aggressive spots within the wastewater treatment facility that are made from concrete, the goal of these linings is to keep that bad environment from ever coming in contact with your concrete. So the linings themselves protect, from the, the, protect the concrete from that surrounding environment. They provide a much longer life cycle for the substrate that they are protecting. I showed you some photos of 10-year-old uh, assets within a, a wastewater treatment plant. We, had, we estimate on the epoxy coatings and linings that we could put on top of these, we estimate a life cycle of 30 to 40 years with zero corrosion. So there, there, there are solutions that can be done to prevent a lot of these issues that I showed you photos of from happening. The available chemistries include epoxy and polyurethane. Epoxy is the most common. And here's an after photo on the right hand side of my screen of a manhole that has been rehabilitated and aligned with the epoxy coating. That manhole that you're looking at the photo of there on the right will look pretty much identical to what it does in that photo with the exception of being dirty. It'll look identical to that 20, 30 years from now. These are some really, really tough lining systems that we've developed to put down into these structures. The pros of an epoxy lining is they're moisture tolerant. Concrete, we all know, is very difficult to get dried out in a below ground area, uh, especially where we have water going on and just, you know, all the different things that we have to deal with whenever we start coating stuff below grade. Epoxy linings can be coated or can coat over visibly damp concrete. So they adhere well. It does not hurt the performance characteristics of them and it makes them very much easier to install. High film builds, high strength, low odor, uh, and chemical resistance. There's a couple of different formulations where this stuff can be sprayed or hand troweled, and I'm gonna show you a video upon the completion of this, a video of where we mixed up some and we hand troweled it. Polyurethanes, similar as far as the protection characteristics, but they're very flexible. They're made for structures that could be on a fault line near an earthquake zone, potential earthquake zone, 
or a structure that's within the roadway where we know we're going to have a lot of impact. They actually are flexible, whereas the epoxies are very rigid. They're very hard. The downside of the polyurethanes, they do not tolerate moisture during application or initial cure. They're a little bit more complex to spray and they require a primer. Whereas the epoxies, as I'll show you in the video, is a one stroke, a one time application. The polyurethanes require two and three coats. <clears throat> the photo on the left is a photo of a lift station that we rehabilitated as well. And this is a picture with using the polyurethane liners. From the photos, the epoxy liners really look about the same and the end result ends up being about the same. But this specific one uh, on a military base up in North Carolina, uh, we used the polyurethane because again, uh, there, was, there was some concerns with where this one was at. On that military base, they actually test explosives and there was a lot of ground vibration. So they wanted to go with a polyurethane, something a little bit more flexible. If you'll notice on that photo on the left, again, you see the exposed rebar. We had lost about two and a half inches of concrete in this structure as well too. So after we did the clean out, wash out, this is what we were starting with is what you see on the photo on the left. We used a microsilicate repair mortar to bring everything back up to the original plane and give it the structural integrity that the engineer designed this uh, structure to have. We replaced the concrete back solid like it was supposed to be to a uniform surface. And then as the photo on the right shows, we put a chemical resistant liner on this structure to where again, we're expecting that 25, 30 year life cycle with it looking just like it does there. This is about a five-year-old photo I have seen. Uh, I saw this same structure about a year ago, uh, and it still, like I, like I said, it still looks about like it does in the photo on the right, with the exception of being dirty. To give you, a, for instance, for how much microbial-induced corrosion has occurred, though, this photo on the left, this is about a 15-year-old structure. This structure is about 15-year-old, is about, about 15 years old and again has lost about three inches of its structural integrity. A couple of the QA, QC testing methods that go on in the sewer collections uh, industry, and I'm just gonna mention these, I'm not gonna delve too deep into these. Uh, the first one I'll speak of is vacuum testing. Uh, there's adhesion testing uh, that I recommend doing whenever uh, we do our lining systems and our rehabilitation systems to do that adhesion testing. We do film thickness measurements. We do cube testing of the concrete repair materials to make sure we're getting the structural integrity. <coughs> and then holiday testing, which is basically making sure that we have a pinhole free surface whenever we do our chemical resistant liquid liners in these structures. Holiday testing is the best insurance policy you can have that your applicator has done the work correctly. I mentioned RFP qualifications. You know, this work is a little bit challenging work. Uh, I put some notes in here as far as contractor experience or licenses or whatever the case may be. But the comment I want to make is if you guys give consideration to hiring a contractor uh, to do a rehabilitation on your clarifier or uh, headworks or a lift station or whatever the case may be, make sure that you're using contractors and include some sort of qualifications in your bid documents that require you to only get contractors who have done this type of work at some point in the past. I've said this for years, you don't want that contractor's first job doing this type of work to be on your job. Let them practice on somebody else's and get some experience and figure out what they're doing on somebody else's job. Make sure you get people that have experience and understand these products and how to do these. At minimum, make sure the contractor has been through a manufacturer's training. Uh, for instance, with Sherwin Williams, with the company David and I work with, uh, we work hand in hand with contractors who may not have much experience, but we work hand in hand with them to teach them how to do these jobs correctly. And then once they start the jobs, we spend time with them as well too, to again, make 100% sure that you, the owner, is getting what you're paying for. So let's look at a case study. In, in the short version of it, I'm not gonna read all of this, 
But this was about a five vertical foot deep manhole, uh, four foot diameter. And the summary of it is what we did with this one, uh, the surface prep that we did, we did not do abrasive blasting when we went down in this manhole to rehabilitate it. We pressure washed it with 5,000 PSI water to remove any loose or contaminated concrete. We did a mortar rehabilitation. We applied a primer. And then again, because this one was in a roadway, uh, we used a polyurethane liner to go down in this, this hole. This hole was in very poor condition because of the high presence of hydrogen sulfide gas that had caused the concrete block and water to deteriorate to the point where groundwater infiltration and wastewater exfiltration through the walls was possible. They were actually losing sewage into the ground uh, through this manhole. And here's the befores. As you can see in the photos, there was about three, two to three inches of concrete gone in this structure. You can see all this uh, carbonated concrete, which is basically just a paste or a powder uh, that was still hung on to the wall. And you can also see where it's deteriorated all the way back behind that carbonated area as well too. The photo on the left is not as good as a representation because I took this photo, uh, I took it on the shadow side first, but the photo on the right is a real good representation of what kind of shape this structure was in before we started with it. The photo on the left and right both show you what it looks like after all the loose concrete was removed from the walls and the bench. This got us back to a sound substrate. The pH on this concrete when we started was about a seven. Once we pressure washed it and removed all the contaminated concrete, we got up to a pH of about 10. Nine to 10 is what you wanna see before you start doing rehabilitation on your existing concrete structures. If your pH shows, using a simple pH pencil, if your pH shows below a pH of nine or 10, that means you still have contaminated concrete and you need to keep removing further until you get to that higher pH. Just another photo after we had cleaned up the loose concrete. This is the above ground where we were mixing the mortar and getting everything ready uh, to do the application. The photo on the left shows you, and you can see, we've done about half of the structure with the cementitious rehabilitation. And what we're looking to achieve is to one, build back the structural integrity of that manhole, of that concrete structure. We wanna build the integrity of it back, but also we wanna provide a good smooth surface to where we can put our chemical resistant liner back over the top of it. This is after the cementitious lining had been completed. Again, we wanted to get it back to where it started before we put the protective coating system over the top of it. This is going in and priming because again, we were using a polyurethane. <coughs> And here's the finished product. So the system as applied on this is a cementitious rehabilitation and then an approximately one eighth of an inch thick protective liner put over the top of it to where again, we're gonna be in that 30-ish year life cycle uh, before, this, before this manhole has any level of corrosion going on within it again. So before I show the video, uh, and the folks that are on here, I uh, put my contact information here. If you want to take your phone out, if you should have any questions or if you want to take my contact information down for later use, uh, if you have any technical questions or any specific project questions uh, or just general, you know, corrosion protection questions, uh, be it about the products I, I work with or any others out there as well too, uh, that you want to talk about, you know, take your phone out and take a photo of uh, my contact information and that way you'll have that as a point of reference moving forward. Uh, be happy to share what information I may have or tips or tricks or uh, some different situations that, that I may have came across that may be similar to yours uh, where I could give some advice on a corrosion protection uh, issue that you may be having. Again, I've been doing this for quite a few years and have seen quite a few different structures and been involved in quite a few rehabilitations. Uh, so I would be happy to lend any knowledge that I have to anyone that's uh, listening to this right now. I put another list of contacts on here as well too. 
And David being the first, he's on this call here, but we have a team uh, who is a whole lot more local than I am, of course. Uh, we have a team down in the Caribbean for you guys to reference to for any uh, assistance with any coatings related issues uh, or any corrosion related issues that you may be having. Uh, if you want to take a photo of this as well too, of this slide, this has their contacts and what specific islands they work on. And I'll move forward to the next group of islands. And again, if you want to take a photo of that just for future reference. These are, these are the people who are the local eyes and ears that can help you out. And again, from a, from a standpoint of, of email or telephone conversations, uh, I, I, could, I would be happy to help you out on these as well too. So I want to do, and I know my time is getting very short, uh, but I want to do a quick video if this works. So I'd spoke about the concrete rehabilitation materials. Uh, I wanna actually show you what it is to, to mix and apply uh, what's really involved with these chemical resistant liners. Uh, this is a video that I made, so it's not professional. I apologize for that in advance. Uh, but this is a video I put together actually just showing the, uh, what some of these, uh, what, how some of these products apply. So I'll just show this real quick. And I'm gonna fast forward through this somewhat. At this point, they're putting the part A into the pail. I'm sorry, the part B into the pail. The epoxy material itself is a two component material with a part A and a part B. He's getting ready to measure out the part A. I'm gonna skip forward of him pouring that into the pail. So he has the part A and part B inside that five gallon bucket. So he's mixing up the liquids themselves, the part A and part B, and just getting a good mix on those. Now fast forwarding it so we don't have to sit there and watch him drill mix. Now he's putting a, a sand aggregate into that liquid resin itself. And the reason we're doing this is epoxy resins can be applied two different ways. One, they can be sprayed on these structures, or two, they can be hand troweled. On a lot of smaller structures, it's a whole lot simpler to hand trowel the material in place. And that's what they're getting ready to do by adding this aggregate into that epoxy resin. I'll fast forward on through it a little bit. Again, he's just drill mixing everything up thoroughly. And now he's getting ready to start the application process. And as you can see, what he's trailing on there is 
about an eighth of an inch thick. This on existing concrete, on, on concrete that needs rehabilitation, you can build this particular material up to about a half inch at a tick, uh, per application. And that way you can actually rehabilitate your concrete and put a protective liner on there all at once. On this test structure that we were doing in this video, uh, this was just a new piece because he just wanted something there uh, to where his guys could practice troweling it a little bit. But again, as you can see, uh, as you can see, he's putting about an eighth of an inch on in each different pass. So that is enough of a corrosion protection system to where again, this is gonna be a 30 year life cycle on this material and we're not gonna have any concrete degradation to speak of. Again, I just checked the thickness on this video. Uh, he was putting on about 120 mils, which equates to, again, about, a, about an eighth of an inch. I'll show you one more part of it here where he was getting ready to strike off the joint itself. And as you can see, he's filling in the joint and again, putting the protective liner on there as a single, sort, a single point of application. So for the sake of time, we don't have to sit here and watch him trowel a lot of material. But I did want to I did want to show everyone that video. There is uh, there is Sherwin Williams, the company we work for, uh, as well as other companies, have stuff available to you folks down in the Caribbean to where you have access to that. Uh, there are technical representatives. Again, Dave is the one that works for us uh, that is available to you down in the Caribbean. I, I put your other contacts down there as well, too, that can give you some guidance as far as, you know, what may be the best for your specific application that you have, uh, be it in the plant or also uh, be it in the collection system as well, too. So that being said, that being said, that concludes my presentation. Uh, so I will we'll ask again, if anyone has any specific technical questions, I, I'm looking at the chat. I don't see any uh, posted on the chat, uh, but uh, if anyone wants to unmute and has any specific questions, I'll be happy to try to address those for you. Okay. So with that, I'll, uh, assuming no questions, I'll turn it back over to Mr. Jean. You're muted, sir. Sorry, my mic was off, my apologies. No worries, no worries. I was saying that um, I thought you brought out some good technical areas as far as the designs and the, you know, some of the technical um, details of mm -hmm. the preparation and, and all the, what aspects of the corrosion that can take place. So mm -hmm. I think that could have been pretty useful for some of the operators who are involved in wastewater um, operations. So I don't Standing. know if there, anyone, I didn't see, as you said, anybody had any questions in the chat. But if you do, please feel free um, to ask some questions. And again, if you think of something later on, if anyone thinks of something later on, again, I put my contact information out there. You know, feel free to drop me an email at your convenience. Um, you know, we, myself, and, and the company I represent, Sherwin Williams, you know, we're here to be a resource for you guys. And, uh, you know, on the drinking water side, on the collection side, on the wastewater treatment side, uh, again, we will be a resource for you. Uh, so if you do come across any questions or anything that, uh, that we can do, uh, please just drop us a line. We'll be happy to help. Sure. And we, again, we appreciate the opportunity to speak with you guys today. Um, I don't know if I would put Mr. Gill on the spot. He's the real wastewater man there um, based in Trinidad. 
Yes, we, we have a question from Shannon Vidal in Dominica. Go ahead. Oh, he's not hearing me. Go ahead, Shannon. Oh, you don't seem to have a question. Sorry. But you may have to type in your question. Um, we, we, your audio seems to have a problem. Okay, he's, uh, he says, are there applications for lining sewer pipes? In development, yes, as far as liquid applied coatings. Uh, the, the, the liquid applied coatings are still in the developmental phase, but as far as for lining sewer pipes, there's what's called cured in place piping or CIPP, where basically, and Sherwin-Williams, the company I work for, we're not involved in the in this industry, but I do know enough about it just to be dangerous. Uh, there are companies out there who specialize in it, but basically they install a rubber line through the pipe itself and have a crawler that pushes that through the line and push it through it with air and a crawler and different ways to get it through the line. Once they have the loose rubber pipe inside of it, a bit vision almost like a, a well, almost like a prophylactic, I guess is the best way to say it. Uh, that it's very loose, it's very soft, it goes through the pipe itself, they expand it with air, inject it with air, and push it up against the side of the pipe, and then run heat to it, and it does what's called a cured in place pipe, where it expands the, PV, the plastic material and creates a monolithic seal around the pipe itself. I, I know a little bit about it, but again, I wouldn't call myself a resident expert of it though. But it's referred to, and you can look on Google or any of the other internet sources under CIPP, which stands for Cured in Place Pipe. Any other questions? Oh, did, we, did I see your hand up, Mr. Goo? No? There are no hands up. Um, Brian, we really appreciate um, your contribution this afternoon. Absolutely. And we, we are around, and I think everyone got your contact and that of your team in the Caribbean region. So we certainly, I guess, we will also be, this is being recorded, and we will make it available um, on our Facebook page as well as on our website and we normally circulate it to all the participants so I guess it will be doing the rounds even with some of the managers and can see some of the products that are available and okay. the, I think the knowledge that was um, passed on in terms of the, the technical specifications would certainly be um, useful in some in some respects of, of what has been done in their work. So thank you very much. And thank you. I'd like to wish all of you a good evening and let us keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Oh, there's also Randy's also on. Thank you, Randy, Rambasar. Thank you, everybody. Have, have, a, have a good day. Thank you, Mr. John. All right. Thank you. You're welcome.